Okay. Uh, good afternoon and welcome. I am Kristen Miller, the District Coordinator of Jefferson County Soil and Water Office. I'm also the co-educator in Eagan Tuck Watershed and I would like to take a minute and thank CCSI for helping us put this workshop together for the community. It wouldn't have been possible without him, without them. Now the session will be recorded for later and you can watch it at a later date. We'll try to share that on social media and send it to your email. If you have any questions, during the presentation, use the Q&A feature down at the bottom of your screen. And then if you have any technical questions, use the chat feature and we can try to assist you with those sooner than the questions. I would now like to introduce tonight's speaker, Doug Peterson. Doug received his BS degree in agriculture at Missouri Western State University. He has been the NRCS employee for over 32 years working as a social scientist, state grassland specialist, soil state soil health specialist and region soil health specialist. And for the past 25 years, he has operated his own 20, 250 head cow calf contract grazing work. Doug, take it away. Thank you. Let me see if I can get this shared here. Can you see it? Yes, we can. Very yep. good, very good. Well, good evening everybody out there in Zoom land. Um, seems like we never get to meet in person anymore, so <clears throat> I guess we're all just kind of getting used to this, uh, this type of a meeting anyway. And I got to tell you, for me, um, it's a little tough. I tend to be very, very interactive with, uh, with the crowd in front of me. So um, I have a lot of, generally in my presentations, I have a lot of questions built in for the crowd. So I'll probably just answer those questions for you, all right? So I'm excited to be here. Um, soil health has been a, <clears throat> been, been a big part of my career the last few years in my life uh, and my personal life as well. So this, is, this session tonight is really going to kind of be a, a beginning session on a, a little bit about soil health, but particularly how cover crops uh, influence and impact soil health. <clears throat> and it's really, it's kind of a one-two session. Um, Wednesday night, you'll hear from Jason and Robert, and they'll get into the specifics of, of management of cover crops in your, your area um, there in Indiana. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna kinda, kinda cover some generalities here as we go through tonight. Um, if you got a question, stick it in the, stick it in the chat box there. And one of the one of the moderators will will ask it. Um, I don't have a problem being being interrupted. So if somebody's got a question, just type it in there, and one of the moderators can uh, jump in and ask it while we're while we're there. So the first question I guess I'll ask most folks is, you know, if somebody was going to ask you this question right here, what's the most important thing in your agricultural production system? And this doesn't matter whether it's crop or or perennial grasslands, is it sunshine, minerals, or water? You know, so we know we need sunshine, right? We need, we need nutrients, we need minerals. But I think most of us would agree that generally most people are going to say that the most limiting factor is going to be water. And so I, I think a, a huge part of our management um, needs to be about water management. Um, and maybe not, maybe not in the way that most people think. Okay, so here's, here's a picture of the water cycle, right? You guys all, we had the water cycle in like fifth grade science, right? We've got evapotranspiration, we've got condensation and precipitation, we've got infiltration and runoff. That's, that's the water cycle, right? The whole, the whole thing. So what is the most important item in that, in that whole cycle to us as, as farmers, to us as producers, I guess? Um, is it precipitation, how much it rains? That's important, but, but it, what's more important is how much infiltrates, right? And that infiltration is determined by your management of the land, right? Specifically, that surface, that top inch of that soil, whether the water soaks in or whether it runs off, that's the biggest thing that you have to understand and have to manage, I believe, okay? So here's a great picture that I took a few years ago. Flat land, 
water standing, right? You think, boy, they got a big rain. Well, actually they got about six tenths of an inch of rain and the water's just standing there. This is about an hour after the rain quit, right? So why is that water just standing there? <clears throat> So why isn't that water soaking in? So, here, so here's an example. So if I've got my kitchen table, right, or, or this table right here that my computer's sitting on, and I pour water on this table, will the water go through that table? It, it won't, will it? What do I have to do to my table? So the table where you guys are all sitting, look at that table and say, okay, what do I have to do to get water to go through this table? What are you going to have to do? You're going to have to get holes in that table, aren't you? Right? And so it's the same with this soil in this picture. The reason the water won't go through it is because there's no holes in that table, right? So here's a couple of jars of soil. <clears throat> and so it's just crumbled up dry soil. And the, the difference in organic matter really is only about 1% difference, um, not a big difference. So it's crumbled up soil but one is a really healthy soil and one is a degraded long-term tilled soil. So we're going to, we're going to look at those. So you, you look at those two, you look at those two beakers, right? And you can see in both of them, you can see the voids down through them, right? You can see the cracks where the water would flow down through them, right? And, and you can visualize that when it rains, if we pour water on those, water would run through those cracks, right? Those voids in the soil. That's pore space is what it is in the soil. So now we're gonna add water to it, okay? And you can see what happened to the one on the left. You see how the one on the left, that soil totally, totally disintegrated, didn't it? It didn't go anywhere. It didn't wash away because it's in that beaker, but all the pore space, the soil settled down and filled that pore space pore space in that beaker on the left. The one on the right, those, those little aggregates, they swelled up, but they didn't, from the water, but they didn't, they didn't collapse and, and fall, did they? So what we need is we need soil that has water-stable aggregates, right? We need soil that in the presence of water, when it rains, when it gets wet, it doesn't dissolve, right? I'll, I'll, I'll go back right there since we've got such a quick internet. Is everybody seeing that? I went back a slide. Look at again at the pore space. When we add water to it, look what happens. So now imagine that's a field on the left. So imagine that field on the left. It rains on it. It dissolves like that and then it dries up. How much water is going to soak into that field every rainfall event the rest of that growing season? right? Not very much, is it? And so that's because that soil doesn't have water-stable aggregates. So how do we get water-stable aggregates? Two things that create aggregation in the soil, and only two things. There's no piece of equipment. You can't run a, a vertical tillage tool. You can't run a subsoiler and create aggregation. There's only two things that create aggregation, and they're natural functions of the soil. The first is biotic glues from the soil. So, so imagine, imagine we've got an earthworm burrow right here. We've got this clod, this aggregate. And, and so why does that earthworm burrow in the soil stay in place? Well, you guys have all seen after a rainfall event, you've all seen a, a, a earthworm a trail across the sidewalk, right? It leaves a little slimy trail on the sidewalk. Its body has this secretion on it. And that, that secretion, when it digs a burrow in the soil, it actually leaves that secretion, it cements that burrow into place. So it doesn't have to expend energy in the future to move up or down that burrow, right? And so, so that's an easy one to see, but it's by no means the biggest. The biggest biotic glue, the, the organism that gives off the most biotic glue in the soil are fungi. And in the right, you can see here this, this fluoresced, it's not naturally green, but in this light, it's fluoresced. You can see the droplets of glue on this fungi. And so as this fungi grows through the soil, 
in, a, in an undisturbed soil, fungi can get to be many, many feet long. And as it grows through the soil, it leaks off this, <clears throat> this glue in the soil and cements one individual particle of sand, silt, or clay to another one. And then it glues those to another one and to another one until you end up with these small little microaggregates, which is that crumb structure, that cottage cheese look that the soil has. If we don't have that, then the soil will collapse under, in, in the presence of water, okay? So the first thing that creates that aggregation is those glues, those organisms. The second thing that creates aggregation are exudates from plant roots. So, you know, you've all taken a shovel and tried to dig up a plant before, right? And the soil sticks to the roots. And part of it is, is just the physical action of that soil stick or the roots grabbing the roots. But a lot of it, like the picture on the right. <clears throat> so you can see the roots, you can see the little white root right there, but then you can see all the soil stuck to that root. Plants give off exudates. They give off secretions into the soil and they do it for a variety of reasons. <clears throat> Excuse me. They do it for a variety of reasons. Um, they, 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 they leak out sugars, they leak out enzymes, they do it to break down nutrients. Um, they do it to attract organisms to bring them more nutrients. Um, some plants <clears throat> give up as much as 50% of the energy that they derive from sunshine, minerals, and water. They leak it back out into the soil in an effort to attract <clears throat> biology to bring them more nutrients. They know it, it's like a bait. It's like food plot, right? <clears throat> they know if they put out enough bait, that the biology will bring them more nutrients than they're giving up. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm getting a little frog here. So, if, if we know that those are the two things we need to manage for, we need to manage for root exudates and for biological uh, secretions, we know we've got these basic five principles, right? And we're gonna talk about these principles just briefly. And really, we're going to talk about them in relation to cover crops, because that's what we're really talking about is cover crop management. So <clears throat> our first one here, minimize disturbance. Okay, It's probably, of these five, it's probably the only one that really doesn't pertain directly to cover crops. Okay, Physical disturbance in the form of tillage destroys that biological and ecological integrity of that soil ecosystem. Imagine those, those small, thin fungal hyphae that we just showed. Any kind of tillage that comes through is going to chop and size, reducing the amount of fungi in that soil. Now, that doesn't mean in a tilled soil we have zero fungi, but we have a very, very reduced amount of fungi, okay? Um, and so <clears throat> tillage is, 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 a, is a killer when it comes to fungi. So when we start talking about those biotic glues and that fungal component, no-till systems have to be the beginning of real soil health. Um, maximizing cover. You know, when we start talking about maximizing cover, we've talked, NRCS has talked about it and other conservation groups have talked about ground cover and erosion for a long time. Um, but in recent years, I think one of the biggest benefits of ground cover comes from weed suppression. So here's a great example. So this was a a crop field the year before, planted cover crop on half of it, a winter kill cover crop, and then no cover crop on the left side. And so we have to understand the succession. So that green that you see on the left side are spring annual weeds. So why did they germinate on that left side and not the right side? Well, you have to understand what causes seeds to germinate, what causes any seed, whether it's a weed seed, or a, or a cover crop or a cash crop. There's three things that cause the seed to germinate. Temperature, moisture, and the third one that everybody misses is light, okay? Most of our weed seeds tend to be very small. And, and that means they need, a, there's a signal that they, that they receive from the amount of light that they're exposed to. And if they're shallow in the soil, they get a lot of light and they'll germinate. If they're deep in the soil, 
and they don't receive enough light, they won't germinate, even if temperature and moisture are adequate. That's a, that's a, a self-preservation mechanism. Most of our big seeds, corn and soybeans, we plant fairly deep. And so they don't need much light to germinate. So, so understanding that succession process is a huge one when it comes to ground cover provided by particularly cover crops. Um, here's, a, here's a great example of that very thing, okay? Ron and Michael Willis, some producers I work with here in Missouri. So you can see, you can see the rows on the left planted into that rye cover crop. On the right, there was no rye, but yet the soybeans are still planted there. Why can't you row those soybeans on the right? That's because without a cover crop there, and in this case, without the allelopathic benefit of the rye, they had tremendous uh, weed competition in those soybeans. So, so we can get weed control through, through the elimination of light from in that succession process. And in this case, the rye, the decomposition of the rye actually secretes a, an exudate into the soil, very shallow into that top inch or so of the soil that would prevent those small seeds that are in that top inch of soil, it'll prevent them from germinating. But it almost never causes any issues for our deep seeded corn and soybeans, okay? Long term, our no-tillers who use cover crops <clears throat> report cutting herbicide costs by up to a third. So our next one, maximize diversity, okay, of our, of our principles. You know, for a long time um, in agriculture, for the last several years, we've had very simple systems, corn and soybeans for the most part. Um, but those soil organisms that we need to build those aggregates in the soil, <clears throat> they're like livestock. They're really like you and I. They require a balanced diet <clears throat> to achieve that high performance and maximum productivity. So we've got we've got different plants that not only have different types of root structures, we've got tap-rooted plants on the left, fibrous-rooted plants on the right, <clears throat> but we also have plants that give off different secretions at different times of the year, warm season, cool season, grasses and broadleaf, right? Several different things. So if we only have a corn and soybean <clears throat> rotation with no cover crops, We've only got two of those four plant types, warm season grass, corn, and a warm season broadleaf, which is soybeans. If we add, and I'm not saying that oats and radishes is the best cover crop, okay? I'm not saying that at all. But as an example, if we add a cool season grass and a cool season broadleaf as a cover crop, now without changing our, our crop rotation, we've got all four plant types added in, right? We're gonna be able to feed that biology a much better diet, a more diverse diet. Continuous living roots. <clears throat> this, one, this one is very likely in a, in a cropping system is very likely um, one of the most important. The number one food source for those soil organisms are the exudates off of a living root. Again, we mentioned this a while ago. But in that rhizosphere, that's that thin zone right around that root, that plant leaks those secretions into that zone to feed that biology. It's a feed bunk, it's a feed trough for those soil biology. But if we have a corn and soybean system, no cover crops, how many months of the year do we have a living root in that soil? three, four, maybe, you know, really by the time corn hits about black layer, it's not giving off any more exudates. So it may still be in the field, but it's not feeding that biology. And so we, we can't, if we want that, that aggregation to be, to be going on year round, if we want carbon to be stored in that soil, if we want to feed that biology year round, we have to have a living root in that soil all year long, okay? Dr. Rick Haney with ARS, um, developer of the Haney Soil Test, he, he makes it a very, very simple statement. He says, roots fix soil. 
If you want to feed that biology, put a living root in it. If you want to break up compaction, put a root in it. If you want to sequester carbon, if you want to build organic matter, put a root in it. Um, virtually any improvement, any function of that soil that you want to improve will improve by putting a living cover crop root in it. Okay. And so that's, I think that one is just a huge, a, a huge part of this whole, of this whole circle of principles here. And then the next one, integrate livestock. Um, one of my, one of my personal favorites, you know, cows actually add biology. If we know we've got a degraded soil ecosystem from a biology standpoint, there's actually biology in the manure that the cows leave behind. There's biology in the saliva. There's biology in the milk foam when a calf is nursing and he's sucking and that milk foam falls on the ground. Um, so cows actually add biology to that soil. Um, and, then, and then there's the profitability side of it. Jason Saunders, a, a fellow I work with here in Missouri, you know, and there's many others um, who consistently tell me that it is pretty easy to take $100 per acre in, in profit in grazing days off of a cash crop field, corn and soybean cash crop field, plant a cover crop after it and graze it. Um, either in the fall, if you get it planted early enough, you can graze it in the fall or in the spring. In this photo right here, Jason is grazing this in the spring. And so to get that $100, you know, at, at, at even say $1.20 per day, per animal, um, you're only talking a little under 3,000 pounds of forage biomass to achieve that $100. Um, find me one, one producer out there that, that couldn't use an extra $100, uh, $100 profit per acre on that cropland, okay? And then, and then he lets it grow back up. So that, that picture right there is in April. So he strip grazes it on about a two day to rotation, lets it grow back up, and comes back a month later and plants soybeans into it with, with a tremendous increase in stored carbon because of that grazing event. Now he's got great ground cover for weed control, great erosion control, and he's still gonna plant and harvest a cash crop off of it. The majority of our producers that are, that are doing this um, find that that they get improved actually improved yields by using soybeans into this into this this in, in this case cereal rye so do we do we i guess i'll stop for just a quick second there is there any questions did i see any feel free to type in the q a box if you look at the bottom okay. of your screen you'll see uh Next to participants, Chad, it should say Q&A. If you have any questions, you're welcome to put them in there. I'll, I'll, I'll move on here. I just, I wasn't evidently with mine in, in presentation mode, I can't see the questions. So, so if, if, if we know, we've, we've kind of talked about those principles and we say, okay, you know, I know I need to do something with cover crops. You've convinced me now we got to start making a plan. What are we going to do? What species are we going to use? And so we've got a few slides here with just some, some species. Um, Jason and Robert, Wednesday night, Jason and Robert are really going to get into some specifics. Um, they're going to talk fence and water, and they're going to talk mixtures and rates for your specific area, okay? So, but, but, but these, these are some of the most common cover crops used all across the Midwest. Um, We've got cool season grasses, um, annual ryegrass and cereal rye are probably the two most common, but barley, oats, wheat, and triticale um, are right in there. The one thing I will make sure and mention is those top two, annual ryegrass and cereal rye, are not the same thing, okay? We get a lot of people, you know, going in and ordering rye, or give me some of that ryegrass, you know, and you need to make sure they are very different plants and they have very different places and very different um, reasons for planting them. Um, one is truly an annual, an annual grass and the other is a biennial grain, okay? So we need to make sure what you're using there. Um, oop, went too far. 
Worm season grasses, pearl millet, Japanese millet, sorghum sedan grass, forged sorghum teff. Of those, probably the most common that most people are used to is sorghum sedan grass, um, used for a lot of uh, forage plantings in the summer. Um, you wouldn't ever plant this, you know, after a corn or soybean harvest in the fall, um, just too late. Um, so these are all gonna generally be planted maybe after a wheat harvest in the summer. Um, maybe if you're gonna do a, a full season cover crop to graze, you could do that. Um, cool season broadleafs, radish, turnip and rape, kale, collards, mustard, phacelia. Um, of those, probably radish and turnips are the most common, particularly from a, from a grazing standpoint. A um, uh, lot of opportunity to graze those, but they need to be planted early, okay? Planting them late, um, you would never plant in, in most areas. Now, where you're at in extreme southern Indiana, you know, you might get away with a, a, a fairly late planting of turnips or radish. But, but me, for example, right here on the Missouri-Iowa line, boy, we just can't hardly plant, plant them and get much growth past the 1st of September. You know, if we get a really, really late open fall, you might get by planting them the 10th or 15th of September. But um, anything after that, and they're just, they're not gonna, they're not gonna do much. Warm season broad leaves, buckwheat, buckwheat safflower, sunflower, um, really common buckwheat is probably the most common of those non-leguminous uh, warm season broad leaves. Um, just a great plant um, for a, a lot of different things. Um, now we switch to, to some broad leaves, but these are all gonna be cool season legumes. Um, vetches, you got several of the vetches, crimson clover, several of the, of the uh, perennial clovers, red, white, alcyke, um, winter peas, also called field peas. Um, generally, those their Austrian winter peas is the most common variety or, or species. Um, and, and a lot of people in some areas of the country, they call them field peas. So those are winter peas. Um, of the vetches, probably the most common is hairy vetch. Um, all of these can fix, all of these different plants can fix varying amounts of uh, nitrogen. Warm season legumes, cowpea, soybean, sun hemp, chickpea, mung bean. Um, of those, probably, particularly for grazing, um, cowpea and soybeans are probably the most commonly used um, from, a, from a grazing standpoint. Um, several people will include sun hemp uh, in grazing uh, mixtures as well. We very seldom see a monoculture of sun hemp like that. Um, and in fact, if I was gonna, gonna graze it for sure, I wouldn't use a sun hemp um, in a monoculture. Some, and, I've, and honestly, I've never seen it, but I have read some literature where they will talk about um, some sun sensitivity created in livestock that are grazing monocultures of sun hemp. Um, I know a lot of people have grazed sun hemp in mixtures and have never seen any of those issues. So just something to be aware of, particularly if you're gonna graze it. Um, but the two most common that, that I have grazed quite a bit in the summer actually are the cowpea and the, and the soybean. Um, for, for all of those legumes, you need to make sure that you, that you inoculate that seed. Um, if you're if you're trying to get maximum growth and nitrogen product production out of those legumes, um, even if it's something that maybe has been planted, red clover for example, you know, if you've had red clover before, um, I would still inoculate it to to just ensure that you get uh, that rhizobium bacteria that can fix nitrogen for those legumes. Um, there's, there's honestly, there's really not much seed sold anymore that, that doesn't come pre-treated already. Um, most seed vendors have just found that, that the very best thing they can do for their customers is to go ahead and, and pre-treat that. But you need to ask about that and you need to make sure that that, that uh, inoculant is specific to your particular legume cover crop species, okay? Um, bin run seed, you know, you see a picture here of just a handful of bin run seed. And so what bin run means is just that. They harvest a, a cover crop seed. Um, somebody harvests it maybe for themselves. They throw it in a bin without cleaning it. 
And so you can see here, we've got the cover crop seed, the grain in the middle, the big seeds, but then you see all those little dark spots. Most likely that's gonna be weed seed, okay? And so even if somebody harvests their own seed, I generally always recommend they go ahead and clean it, unless it's just a super, super clean, um, did, did a great job harvesting it, it didn't have any weeds in it. Um, maybe you might get by with bin run seed, but in most cases we're still gonna recommend that you at least get it clean to eliminate that. You sure don't wanna you know, introduce any, any weed seeds in that you, that you have there. Um, certified or VNS, what does VNS mean? Variety not stated. Um, you know, a lot of seeds are, are specific varieties and they're maintained by seed producers in pure stands. And so they will have a certified seed, but a, a lot of people, particularly with the cereals now, okay, because there's, there's such a huge market for rye, wheat, triticale, oats, for example, those bulky um, cereal grains. We're getting a lot of seed produced um, that is not necessarily a specific variety, or, or at least it's not certified as a specific variety. Um, if you know where it came from, if it came from a producer and you know that it was one specific variety, then great. But if, if it's not, if you don't know where it came from, I'd be very hesitant to, to buy um, variety not stated. Here's, I've, seen a, I've seen some fields with this, okay? And here's the example. So, so I went out to a field and the guy was, was going to roll this field and he goes out there and looks at it and he's got, he's got some plants scattered all across the field that's head high and seeded out. And there's other plants in that same field that are a foot and a half tall and extremely vegetative. And, and if he rolled it, it wouldn't kill him. Okay. So that's one of the things you're going to get. You can potentially get from a, a, a lot of seed that is variety not stated. It's mixtures of several different um, production runs of that seed. Okay. So it's just something to be careful of. So one of the other things you've really got to think about is what's your seeding time frame? Is this a spring planting? Are you going to graze it in the summer? Is this a, an early summer planting after a uh, wheat harvest? You know, is it a, a late summer planting, a fall after a crop? Um, and one that's not on here so much is a really early spring. I've seen several guys now go in, if, if it was a, a harvest that was really late in the fall and they didn't feel like they could get it planted, they might come in and in March, if they get a break in the weather and plant some oats and field peas, um, make some awesome forage, give it about 30, 40 days right there. And it'll be an awesome grazing opportunity. So that's when you start looking this, you got to start a plan. You got to start thinking about, okay, when am I going to plant this cover crop? And what, what, what's my goal? What am I really trying to get out of it? There's a lot of different ways to plant it. The most common and the most consistent from a results standpoint is going to be to drill it. Um, it also takes the most time, but it gives you the best, generally the best seeding results because you're going to get a good seed to soil contact. Um, it provides uniform row spacing. If you're using like a seven, in, a six, seven, or maybe even a 10 inch drill, um, you get a great stand out there. Okay. So that's probably the best one in most cases. Um, an air seeder on a, on a rolling harrow or a vertical tillage tool. Um, you know, they, they cover a lot of ground pretty fast, but generally, unless you've got a, some type of a, of a box set up on that, on that tillage tool, they're going to have to make a second trip across it to broadcast it. Um, and then if we start thinking about our principles again, boy, we've just got a lot of soil disturbance there that we have to try to make up for. So, so, it can be used, but generally it's probably not going to be on my favorite from a recommendation standpoint. Um, a lot of people fly it on. Um, in your part of the world, flying probably is going to work a little better with, with higher fall and winter moisture. It's going to work better than in my part of the world. Um, you know, it gives you a lot of flexibility. Probably the best opportunity in most areas is going to be to fly a, a cover crop on right prior to leaf drop on soybeans. Okay, that's gonna be your best opportunity 
um, to fly a cover crop on is, is into soybeans right before leaf drop. Um, you know, the drawback is um, that, that because we're not getting see good seed to soil contact, um, we're going to rely on rainfall to germinate it. Um, so a lot of times we'll up our seeding rate a little bit when we do that. And if we're going to use a mixture that we're planning on grazing, generally those grazing mixtures have a little bit higher seeding rate and boy, it's not going to become quite as practical to fly those higher uh, volume rates on. Okay, um, something that's becoming a little more common in, uh, across the Midwest is using a high boy, converting a sprayer, put a put a, a metering box on it, and using this to go into standing corn. Um, this is a great opportunity to get that cover crop growing um, before, and, and you know we might gain a month's worth of growth. On a, on a cover crop if we had to wait and, and plant it after harvest, right? Um, and then a last one here, you know, if you've got a precision planter, a 15 inch row planter, um, you can do some things like this where you can, you can plant one row with a, something that might winter kill, in this case a radish, and then a grass in the, in the other row. While it's not, you know, we don't get nearly as good a coverage across that soil, um, we do generally get good consistent results. We get good seed to soil contact and it's a piece of equipment that you, that a lot of farmers already have. Um, just a couple more slides here. We'll, we'll be, be done. So uh, other opportunities to, to get some growth is interseeding. This one is really coming on here in the, in the last few years. Um, planting it, planting it, you know, somewhere between that, V4 and V6 or V7 stage gets those cover crops to germinate. Um, the trick is, is to have species that can tolerate really low light conditions under that corn. Um, but if you can do that, boy, um, you talk about like the slide on the, on the bottom right there, you just gain a, almost a month's worth of growth um, in the fall. If you're particularly, if you're grazing it in the fall. So termination, you, you've got to have a game plan. Before you plant anything, know how you're going to terminate it. Is this going to be something that winter kills? Are you going to use frost to terminate it? Are you going to roll it? Are you going to use chemical to burn it down? Are you going to hay it, um, shred it? Are you going to use tillage? Um, and then the biggest one that's not on there, right, is grazing. Um, I think grazing is an awesome opportunity. But generally grazing, there's very few species that you're actually going to terminate um, by grazing it. Um, it's just, it's, you're not going to eliminate the one of these, right? A lot of, a lot of uh, potential for herbicide carryover that will kill some species of cover crops. So you really have to have um, careful planning when you're doing this, when you're planting cover crops. And, and in some cases, some of these chemicals have a two, maybe a two year carryover depending on rainfall. In your higher rainfall areas, your carryover is not gonna quite be as big of an issue. Um, but it, again, it's something to think about and something to plan for. So just, just a summary here, key points. Um, earlier fall seedings usually result in better germination, tillering, growth, survival, and ultimately more biomass. If we're talking those cereals, wheat, rye, or, or triticale, um, and any of the others, clovers, the earlier in the fall, the better, okay? Just planting something in, you know, December, even in your part of the world, boy, it's just not going to get a ton of, of growth in the fall, and, and it probably will lead to a little bit less biomass in the spring, although, although some studies show that that's really not the case. It kind of makes up for it in the spring. Um, and, and delaying termination in the spring on your part can also help compensate for that. Um, hey, Doug. Plant green. A lot of people have started planting green today, um, planting, planting particularly soybeans into a green growing living cover crop and terminating it at planting or even after planting. Um, I have a question for you, Doug. Yeah, ma'am. Um, Jason's asking, what are your thoughts on incorporating annual crops into perennial pastures? And then as an example, warm season annuals into a cool season pasture. You bet. So I don't, I don't have a picture in here of that, but I'll tell you my, my personal experience and the experience of most people that I've worked with, 
it kind of goes back to that slide that I talked about where I talked about plant succession. Um, generally annuals, if, if you think about an annual, okay, in, in the natural world, where do annuals exist? When would annuals, weeds, naturally thrive in, an, in the natural world? Those weeds would thrive, those annuals would thrive when some type of uh, a fire, a flood, when something eliminated all of the perennial plants, then the annuals, hey, that's their signal to take off. So, so that's, that's the, 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 the reason why generally we see very few um, producers that have healthy perennial pastures able to get very much when it comes to planting an annual into those perennial pastures. Um, you know, clovers, clovers that are broadcast in the winter are kind of an exception because the cool season grasses aren't really doing much. But I, I, can, I can send you, if anybody's got any, any, uh, any doubt that this will work, there's a few places I've seen it. Um, areas, southern Missouri, areas where it's really hot in the summer, and the, the perennial cool season grasses shut down really hard, they might be able to plant a, a, an annual warm season um, sorghum sedan or cowpeas into that. Um, but but if, if your cool season grasses don't shut down very much, boy, it's going to be pretty tough. It's just not a, because it, it goes against those laws of nature. It goes against that natural um, plant succession. So. Um, and we, we'll come back to that. Um, cover crop planting tools. There's a ton of, of planting tools out there. Um, the NRCS is cover crop standard. Um, Midwest Cover Crop Council. There's other NRCS publications. Um, No-till farmers got some books on it and then various other uh, cover crop publications from industry. Um, so with that, I think our time is about up as far as the presentation. Um, any more questions? Doug, I had a question come in. Um, when planting sorghum sedan grass for either grazing and or baling um, for hay, do you think the brown midrib is worth the higher cost of the seed over the traditional? Um, I would almost always, I would very seldom plant it in a, the sorghum sedan in a monoculture. I would always plant it in a mixture. Um, and, you know, I think if you're going to have it in a real diverse mixture, the, the amount of the seed that, that's going to be sorghum sedan is it, the cost is not going to be that much of a, not much of an issue. If, if it's a monoculture of sorghum sedan, then yes, I can see where your cost is, is going to be different. And, and so I guess it depends on what I'm going to use it for. Um, you know, if it, again, if it was for grazing, I'm going to make it a mixture. And, you know, if, if, if a dollar or two is going to make a difference, then fine. I, I, you know, it's not going to be that big of a deal in a mixture. The cost won't be that big of a deal or the difference in quality won't be that big of a deal if you decide to go, you know, not, without the BMR. Jason, did I get your, did I get that question on incorporating annuals? Uh, I think I'm well going to, I think I'm going to turn the allow to talk buttons on for people um, since there aren't that oh, many okay. of us. Um, it might make it easier if, you bet. if people want to have a dialogue. Yeah, Doug, I, I, I think so. I just, uh, we've been playing with a little bit and didn't know if I was just being lucky or doing something wrong in the way. Your, kind of your comments got me wondering about the, the health of my permanent pasture, but I've been trying to put some warm season annuals in, um, you know, the fescue for both for volume and maybe a little better quality feed. Um, you know, in that late summer time frame. And then I actually left some that I got planted in late July or early August and just grew kind of as part of my stockpile and had that, that we just finished up grazing last week. And 
didn't know it. I didn't have any way to put in good numbers to it, but I got a decent stand. I didn't know if you had experience or seen it or if I'm lucky or unlucky. I don't know which way to look at it. You know, the, I, I've, I've tried it several years where I'm at here in North Missouri and because our summers don't get near as hot as say South Missouri and our soils are enough better. If, if we manage our perennial cool season grasses fairly well, they, they don't really, I mean, they may not be growing really crazy actively, but they don't shut down very much. And I can, I can show you picture after picture that I, where I've planted cool uh, or warm season perennial, warm season annuals into a cool season perennial and the sorghum sedan gets about a foot tall. Well, I, when, when I started doing the, it doesn't pay for me, you know, unless, unless I'm doing some type of a renovation, if I'm going to spray and kill some fescue, um, then I can generally probably get an, uh, you know, enough production. I've, I've toyed with several things. I've used some gramoxone to try to set the cool season grasses back. And I can kind of do that, but, but if I do that, then I'm giving up perennials. So I, I, for, for me, where I'm at, I could never really figure out where it could, where it, where it paid. You know, I, I know I've got some friends in South Missouri that's really more droughty, shallower, rockier soils and <clears throat> their per, cool season perennials really shut down pretty hard in the summer. And they, they can do pretty well. They can plant a, a summer annual. And if they get a, a timely rain, they can do really well. But um, I think that, that comes back to context, where you are at, um, what your situation is. Um, you know, I think, that's, I think that's where that comes in. And I, well, we got, this year we had, you know, it's probably, you know, three foot tall when we started grazing and, and got pretty good size. So I so said, we got along pretty, but I was just thinking along the lines of, of soil health, you know, with a predominantly cool season pasture, trying to get some other plant species in there. Is that going to be a benefit over time if I did it in an area and then went back and, you know, is that going to have a two or three year effect of adding a different um, species in there or am I just, wishing in the brain or anybody, or you have any idea? I guess that was, was part of the question as well. I, I, I don't know that anybody has any idea. I mean, there are examples of, of people, you know, North Dakota, the guys up there can, can spray out a brome field and, and plant a diverse cover crop mixture in there. Again, you know, how did they do that? They had to spray out the perennial to get the, the diverse annual cover crop to grow. Um, so I think there's times to do that. We have done a little bit of that with, you know, in, in renovating fescue fields. Um, but planting, planting, I just have not, I've seen very few circumstances where, where it paid for itself to plant an annual into a perennial if you weren't going to spray it, you know. Um, you know, if you've got some, if you've got some breeding heifers or some dairy cows or some yearling heifers or some grass finishers, if you've got some higher value animals, then it might pay to do that. But boy, if all you've got is beef cows, um, I, the numbers I have done for myself, I just, I can't make it pay. That's just based on additional grazing days, I guess. Is yeah. What you're basing right. Okay. Right. Yeah. It, it, because if I, if I plant some annuals in there, yeah, I can get a little bit of annual productivity and it's probably way better quality than, than my perennial, but for a mature mama beef cow, that, that's a non-issue. That doesn't really help me very much. Right. If I've got something that can utilize that high quality, some grass finishers, some, some yearling heifers, then, then, okay, that's a little bit different story but I'm excited to hear what you and what you and Robert have to say on Wednesday night. I think that'll be a great, a great one, two punch with some basics tonight and, and some real specifics on, on Wednesday night. I think folks will enjoy that. I've seen, 
I've seen both of those presentations um, and, and I think you guys are going to, I think it's going to be really good. Doug, this is Dave Trotter. And, and I, <clears throat> I noticed on one of your slides, you had pure live seed and a seed tag there, but you kind of skipped over it in your discussion. Um, it might be helpful for some folks to realize why that uh, purity was down so much. Um, and I know that's probably the reason you put it up there, but you did mention PLS in your, in your heading. Yeah, pure, pure live pure live seed is is just that. It's a it's a calculation when they do, um, you know, when when they when they evaluate seed, it's how much purity is in there. Um, a lot of those are are down um, fairly low because because they have a they have a, a a treatment on them. The seed coating actually will will cause that to be be down quite a bit. Um, and that's where you calculate that, that pure live seed is calculated from, from the purity plus the hard seed um, and, and making sure that when you apply, when you plant, most NRCS, for example, and I don't know about Indiana, but a lot of states actually require a certain amount of pure live seed. So you actually know how much seed you're getting on. Um, I've, I've seen some seed tags that you know, mainly only had five or ten, five or ten percent pure live seed. Um, had a lot of, uh, you know, hard seed in it, and so to get any kind of a stand, you're going to have to plant a, a, a boatload of seed. So, yeah, pure live seed is always something that we want to consider. Um, I think it's a good thing to use too whenever you're pricing seed. If you've got a choice between two different um, lots of seed you do that quick calculation of pure live seed, just so yeah. you know what you're paying per pound of pure live seed. I yes. think that's helpful. That's a great comment, you bet. Yeah, there's been a lot of, I mean, generally the seed industry <clears throat> does a pretty good job of, of, of kind of regulating itself, but because of the huge increase in the acreages of cover crops, um, there's a, there's, there's some questionable seeds coming onto the market here and there. So um, you really want to do your homework when you're, when you're, when you're purchasing seed, that's for sure. Thanks for that, Doug. Are there any last minute burning questions here in our last five minutes or so? Kristen, do you want to? I put my email and my number up there for just a minute if anybody, and as I understand it, this, you guys will have this presentation later. If anybody's got any questions, um, feel free to email or email or call. Great. Thank you for that. Thanks for the invitation to talk, folks. Okay. Kristen, did you have any last minute instructions for folks that might be coming on uh, Wednesday as well? Yeah, if we don't have any other questions, that's really all we have for tonight. But I do want to remind everybody that on Wednesday, we have our second session at six o'clock. Um, we, you will use the same link that you use tonight. Um, so if there's nothing else, then just use that same link. Then we'll see you on Wednesday and See you then. Great. Thanks for joining, everybody. Thank you, Doug. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ladies. Yep. Thank you. Everybody have a good evening. You too.